I have been waiting for this one for a while. Um, so this topic is um, pretty personal to me, actually, because I had originally gone on a ketogenic diet to lose weight and get healthier. But one thing that I had discovered is that two months in, the chronic depression that I'd had since I was about 11 years old um, had gone into complete asymptomatic remission which is not what I had been expecting, um, but I was quite pleased with that to actually be able to feel happy again and um, enjoy life. Um, so Georgia Ead um, is going to be speaking on the science of hope, a powerful new dietary approach to mental health problems. And she is a Harvard trained board certified psychiatrist specializing in nutritional and metabolic psychiatry. Her passion is empowering people with psychiatric conditions to reduce or eliminate the need for medications by changing how they eat. Her current work is all about discovering which changes are worth making and why. And Dr. Ede co-authored the first inpatient study of the ketogenic diet for treatment-resistant mental illness, developed the first medically accredited course in ketogenic diets for mental health practitioners, and was honored to be named a recipient of the Bazooki Brain Research Fund's first annual Metabolic Mind Award. Her new book, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, was released this year. And um, for those of you who participated in our book club, we discussed her book, and I've mentioned it about 10 times <laughs> through this event. Um, so let's give it up for Georgia Ede. Siobhan, that was a, such a nice introduction. Thank you. And it's really great to see you. We haven't seen each other for such a long time. Siobhan and I know each other. We go way back, many conferences and our friends. And so um, I'm really, uh, really honored to be here and to be invited. Uh, and and thank you very much for, for, for doing a book club on the book. I really, really appreciate uh, the support for the book. As a project, of course, near and dear to my heart that I hope will be really helpful to people, um, whether you have a mental health uh, issue or not, uh, uh, and, or, and, and certainly if you don't have a mental health issue currently, all of you who are listening, of course, you probably know somebody who does. Um, but I did do, you know, I did a little bit, I don't honestly don't know that much about lipedema. So this morning, I spent a little time looking at a few articles about it, and it was interesting to me to see probably no surprise that um, that more than half of people with lipedema, at least according to one study that I saw, are suffering with depression symptoms. Uh, and that, that certainly makes sense, um, especially since, as I understand it, lipedema has a major inflammatory component and inflammation is a big contributor to depression. So if you have inflammation in the body, it's very uh, often that you will also have inflammation in the brain as well, even though you can't you can't see it or feel it happening uh, because the brain doesn't have any nerve endings and you can't see through your skull. <laughs> so you can't see if it's red or swollen or sore. But 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 when we have <clears throat> when we have inflammation in the body, we will often also have inflammation in the brain. And then of course there's the psychological stress of of having uh, any kind of chronic health condition. So I hope that this presentation will be useful to everybody. Um, with with lipedema who is listening and watching i really appreciate everybody coming and uh hope hope that this will that you'll learn something new in the presentation um about food about the brain uh these are both topics that i find really really fascinating so i'm going to start sharing uh my screen with you uh and basically what this presentation aims to do is help to explain why for example, Siobhan would start a ketogenic diet uh, for a completely different reason other than mental health. And voila, her 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 depression, her depression symptoms went away. And that's really not a very uncommon experience. Lots and lots of aspects of mental health can improve when you change your diet in these particular ways. So <clears throat> the and I and I called this presentation the science of hope because uh because it is, these are really hopeful and really powerful science-based, evidence-based interventions, not just for weight loss. I mean, we often think of ketogenic diets as weight loss diets, but uh, and they and they will usually help people who have excess body fat that they're trying to lose. They'll usually help them do that. <clears throat> but uh, but they all but they they um, they also uh, can reduce inflammation, reduce oxidative stress, something called oxidative stress. We'll talk about shortly. 
uh, and they're very powerful interventions for insulin resistance. Uh, so we'll go through how all the different ways that a ketogenic diet can be useful for people with mental and physical health problems. And uh, we'll start here. So <clears throat> when I, I'm, I've been a psychiatrist for 25 years. And when I was uh, studying to be a psychiatrist, I was taught that the root causes of mental health conditions of just about any kind, whether it was anxiety or depression or mood swings or, or uh, cognitive problems, I was taught that these were largely due to uh, <clears throat> two kinds of factors, biological factors and psychosocial factors. So the psychosocial factors are things like, you know, stress and trauma um, and of course your mother. And then I was, and I was taught to address psychosocial root causes of mental health conditions with psychotherapy. And then I was taught that there are biological root causes, and these had primarily to do with things like uh, the genes you were born with and um, uh, chemical imbalances in the brain, in neurotransmitters, things like serotonin and dopamine. And I was taught to address these chemical imbalances with medications. So for 10 years, I prescribed medications and did psychotherapy with patients. And I loved my work. And, uh, you know, I certainly, I, I certainly still use both of these approaches in my practice, psychotherapy as well as medications. But what I was noticing in my work, and this is, uh, I think most psychiatrists notice this, is that my practice was slowly filling up with people who just weren't getting that much better, no matter what I did. And so, uh, and, and so I think there, there was a big piece of the puzzle missing uh, for me and, and, and my colleagues when we're working with people and trying to help them with mental health. So, <clears throat> and I think that, that that piece has largely to do with, with lifestyle in general and diet in particular. So what I, I, medications can change brain chemistry and they can be helpful for some people. Um, but I have come to understand that the most powerful way to change brain chemistry is through food, because that's where brain chemicals come from in the first place. And not just brain chemicals, but every every part of the brain, every cell in the brain, the fluid that bathes the brain, um, all of the salts, um, <clears throat> the membranes, uh, the mitochondria where energy is made, every single bit of that of your brain comes from the food you eat. So so if we if we understand that diet can make a difference, uh, we in terms of brain health, what does the brain want to eat? What is a brain healthy diet? Uh, what is the best diet for the brain? So there are two schools of thought about this. Um, uh, there are two brand new branches of psychiatry, uh, which are both really exciting and, and are bringing new hope to people around the world. And one branch is about 10 years old or so. Uh, it's called nutritional psychiatry. And that's a coin, uh, a term coined by uh, Professor Felice Jacka, uh, a research psychologist at the University of Dakin in Australia. And she's um, she's done a number of studies on the Mediterranean diet, including randomized controlled trial, considered the highest level of evidence. So most thought leaders in the uh, in this relatively new field of nutritional psychiatry recommend the Mediterranean diet as uh, as the ideal diet for brain health. Now, where so I consider myself a nutritional psychiatrist, <clears throat> and all nutritional psychiatrists, what we believe is that what's largely driving the rise in mental health conditions around the world is the deterioration and the quality of our, of our modern diet. So I, I firmly believe that, as do all nutritional psychiatrists. It's just that we may not all have the same opinion about which diet is the best diet to switch to from the stand so-called standard American diet. So if we all agree that, okay, the standard modern American diet or Western diet or whatever you want to call it, the modern industrialized diet, if we can all agree that that diet is not good for the brain, what diet should we replace that diet with? So most nutritional psychiatrists believe that the Mediterranean diet is the best uh, choice. And, 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 and with good reason, because there are, as I was saying, these very high quality, what are called randomized controlled trials, where uh, people with uh, major depression, uh, who are eating a typical modern diet, when they switch to a Mediterranean diet, you can see a significant improvement in uh, in clinical depression symptoms. And you can even, some people will even uh, see their depression symptoms go into remission. 
So, so we do know that the Mediterranean diet is a much better diet for the brain than the, than the so-called standard American diet. Um, and we see in study after study after study in other fields of medicine, cardiovascular disease, uh, for example, um, lots of other, regardless of the health issue that's studied, the Mediterranean diet outperforms the standard American diet in just about every study. So it is a much healthier diet than, uh, than the uh, so-called standard American diet. However, just because it's a better diet for the brain doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best diet for the brain. And uh, so what I what, um, this brings us into a different branch of uh, a new branch, an even newer branch of, uh, of psychiatry called metabolic psychiatry. Metabolic psychiatry, that's a term that was coined five or six years ago uh, by Dr. Shabani Sethi uh, at Stanford University. And, uh, and I also consider myself a metabolic psychiatrist. And we who are interested in metabolic psychiatry, we're interested in the relationship between metabolic health and mental health. So if we have poor metabolic health, say for example, high, high blood sugar levels, high insulin levels, um, to what extent does that poor physical metabolic health influence our mental health? And the diet that most of us in metabolic psychiatry are most interested in, in, uh, in studying isn't the Mediterranean diet, it's the ketogenic diet. And so uh, now, the, now the Mediterranean diet is, you know, as you probably know, the base of the Mediterranean diet is very uh, starchy, st starchy staples like grains and legumes. So things like bread and pasta and cereals and beans. Um, and uh, the, of course, the base of the ketogenic diet um, it, uh, cannot be grains and, and beans and pasta and bread and so forth because a ketogenic diet is a very low carbohydrate diet. The Mediterranean diet contains uh, 45 to 65% carbohydrate. The ketogenic diet is closer to 5% carbohydrate. Before we go further to compare these two diets, um, I just want to stop and give a brief definition of the ketogenic diet because it can mean different things to different people. So um, the, the definition that I'm going to use here and that I use in the book as well is that a ketogenic diet is any way of eating that lowers insulin levels enough to turn on fat burning vigorously enough to generate clinically meaningful levels of ketones in the blood. So, and most would agree, most would say, most experts in the field would say that, that clinically meaningful ketosis begins at uh, 0.5 millimole uh, beta hydroxybutyrate in the blood. And this can be measured with a, a ketone meter that measures um, blood ketones. So it's not necessarily that you'll get your best results at 0.5 millimole. Some people need to go higher than that. In fact, many people do, but that's where you can start to see uh, good things happening metabolically. So it tends to be um, you know, a typical, a, a standard a ketogenic diet will be very low in carbohydrate, moderate in protein, not high in protein as a lot of people um, often will, will uh, believe. And uh, the majority of the calories of the diet come from fat instead of from carbohydrate. So very different from the Mediterranean diet, of course. So this is, uh, so the reason why, um, the reason why metabolic psychiatrists are interested in the ketogenic diet is because the ketogenic diet changes uh, uh, metabolism, changes cell metabolism in the body as well as in the brain in very powerful and very positive ways that a Mediterranean diet isn't capable of doing. So what it basically does is it switches your cells from burning mostly carbohydrate to burning mostly fat. Um, and, and, and so uh, this has a lot of really positive implications for, for mental health. So if we're going to uh, you know, there are lots of different diets in the world, low fat diets, um, low calorie diets, vegetarian diets, vegan diets, ketogenic diets, um, Mediterranean diets, lots of different types of diets. Um, how do we know which diet is best for the brain? Well, I think rather than trying to compare each one of these diets to each other, I think the simplest and best thing to do is to step back and ask a different question what are we trying to accomplish? What does a brain healthy diet need to do? And then if we can all agree on what a brain healthy diet needs to do, then you can take whatever diet you 
uh, prefer to, to follow and compare it to, uh, to those uh, criteria that we're going to set up. And you can see how brain healthy your diet is compared to these brain healthy diet rules. So, <clears throat> so what does a brain healthy diet need to accomplish? It needs to nourish the brain. And that means that it needs to include simply uh, adequate amounts of all essential nutrients. That shouldn't be too controversial. It also needs to protect the brain. So it needs to exclude ingredients which damage the brain. And uh, we're gonna talk about which ingredients those are and what kinds of damage we're talking about in just a minute. And very importantly, and this is where the ketogenic diet comes in, it needs to energize the brain safely and reliably in ways that protect brain metabolism over the lifespan. So uh, this is this is about finding clean, reliable uh, uh, sources of fuel that will generate uh, that will generate uh, energy for the brain as safely and as reliably as possible. So, how do we best nourish the brain? To nourish the brain, you need to know where to get your nutrients, which foods include the nutrients that you're looking for, and you simply cannot. Um, meet the brain's or, or any of your cells' full nutritional requirements without including at least some animal food in the diet. Now, if we're talking about whole, if we're talking about whole foods, hello. If we're talking about whole foods, everybody, hear me okay? I heard an echo there. Um, so uh, it's it's now if you I am nutritionally pro-choice. So uh, I understand some people don't feel comfortable including animal foods in their diet. So, and if that's the case, you really will need to supplement very, very carefully in order to meet all of your nutrient needs. But if you're following whole foods principles, um, and I am a food first psychiatrist, um, then uh, ideally you would include at least some animal food in the diet to, to meet all of your nutritional requirements. So these are the most common nutrient deficiencies um, uh, that we see uh, for example, especially in early life and in pregnancy, um, but these are very common nutrient deficiencies around the world. And uh, it's not a complete list, but the reason why I put these particular nutrients on this slide is because these are the nutrients that are either difficult or impossible to obtain from plant foods. So these either need to be supplemented um, or you need to choose your foods very, very carefully to make sure you're getting enough of these if you're not, if you're trying to uh, uh, eat a plant-based diet. So um, in addition to including animal foods in the diet to meet your nutrient requirements, it's also very important to avoid uh, foods that are working against you in terms of your, of your, of your nutrients. So one of the problems with a plant-based diet or a Mediterranean diet, which is based on grains and legumes, is that grains and legumes are not only very, very poor in nutrients themselves. In fact, grains are so poor in nutrients that most grain products uh, in the grocery store are fortified with vitamins and minerals because otherwise they would be very poor sources of nutrients. Grains and legumes are nutrient poor, but they're also anti-nutrient rich. And so uh, they have lots, they naturally contain a lot of uh, compounds that uh, that guard the nutrients for the sake of the plant. So that so that uh, so that the, uh, the uh, that, that the plant itself can can take advantage of those nutrients. So um, there are many different uh, anti-nutrients found in plant foods, um, but we're gonna, just as one example, we're going to look at phytic acid uh, because phytic acid is uh, found uh, at very in very high amounts in the grains, beans, nuts, and seeds that we are told to base our diets on. And phytic acid is a mineral magnet. So it, it's, its purpose in life is to guard minerals for the sake of the future sprouting plant. Um, so calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc in particular. So here's an example of uh, how strong this effect can be. If you consume um, zinc-rich oysters, oysters are the, the whole food on the planet which is richest in zinc, um, then you will see your blood levels of zinc rise very nicely, and that's a reflection of the fact that you've absorbed zinc beautifully into your bloodstream. So, uh, but what happens if you eat that same amount of oysters with black beans? You absorb less than half of the zinc from those oysters. And if you eat that same amount of oysters with corn tortillas, 
you absorb virtually none of the zinc from those oysters. So this is not a subtle effect. And uh, you know, zinc deficiency is a very common, uh, very commonly seen in, for example, um, ADHD. Uh, you'll often see zinc deficiency and in certain forms of depression. And zinc is a very, very important mineral for the brain. So, so it's very important if you want to nourish your brain <clears throat> to include the right foods, uh, and in particular some animal foods if you're if you're able to do that, and to exclude the right foods, exclude the foods which are working against your ability to nourish your brain. So how do you protect your brain? Uh, we want to really protect our brain uh, um, by eliminating ingredients which are most damaging to the brain. So let's say you've built your diet of healthy whole foods. You've got this core of, of, of healthy animal foods, and you've got healthy whole plant foods, uh, if you wish, as, a, um, uh, as an accompaniment to that. So you're eating a whole, beautiful whole foods diet. You've taken out the grains and the beans and all the, you know, um, uh, and, you, you, and you've, you're eating a beautiful, healthy whole foods diet all week long. And then on the weekend, you decide you're going to treat yourself, say, with a muffin or ice cream uh, or a cookie. Um, what you've just done then is you've taken that beautiful brain that you've worked hard all week to, to nourish, and you've dropped it into a very unhealthy environment of inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance. And so these are the, these are, we used to think that, you know, chemical imbalances were the real root causes of mental health conditions, but we never used to stop to think, well, what causes those chemical imbalances in the first place? And it turns out that we now understand um, that, uh, that inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance, these are the, the true brain damaging forces, which are driving so many of our mental and physical health conditions. And lo and behold, if you look for sources of inflammation, oxidative and stress and insulin resistance, you need to look no further than the so-called standard American diet or SAD diet, because unfortunately now what's been happening over the past 50 to 75 years is that we have gradually been replacing whole plant and animal foods with, uh, with uh, foods that come from fields and farms and fisheries with foods that come from factories. These are so-called ultra-processed foods. More than 60% of what Americans now eat, um, and most of the rest of the world is, is rapidly catching up, is no longer food at all. And really the signature ingredients of the sad or standard American diet, it's not red meat, it's not saturated fat. Those, that's not what's making this diet so dangerous for us. We've been eating red meat and saturated fat since time immemorial. The signature ingredients of the modern unhealthy American diet are refined carbohydrates and refined seed oils, so-called vegetable oils. So these are these were um, the, the, these uh, in, ingredients are found in abundance in ultra-processed foods. So the problem with these ingredients is that that they can lead directly to inflammation and oxidative stress in the brain. So, for example, the way a high sugar diet can lead to inflammation and oxidative stress in the brain is that if, you, if your blood sugar levels are rising too high after meals, which they will, if you either have insulin resistance, which we'll talk about shortly, or if you're just eating too many of the wrong carbohydrates too often, like re, uh, flour, sugar, cereals, fruit juices, all of those naked carbohydrates that turn instantly into glucose in the bloodstream and give you an exaggerated glucose spike in your bloodstream, followed by an exaggerated insulin spike to, to deal with all that glucose. Every time you get a blood sugar spike, you also get a brain sugar spike. And that excess sugar that crosses into the brain literally sticks. It sticks to uh, all the important components in your, in your cells, uh, uh, proteins and DNA molecules and uh, fats. The brain is 60% fat. Um, and so it creates these things called advanced glycation end products, which are kind of sticky caramelized clusters, dysfunctional crippled molecules that, that don't work properly. And if they're allowed to accumulate, um, then they can, they can uh, interfere with normal cell signaling. So the, the immune system of the brain uh, clears these away. Um, uh, but if you're, and, and then, the, then a period of healing will take place. But if you're eating this way, which most of us unfortunately now do, especially children, um, uh, are eating refined carbohydrates six times a day with every meal and every snack, 
it the brain never gets a chance to to heal. The, it, you've got a state of chronic, um, uncontrolled inflammation and oxidative stress. So what's happening is when the brain sees these caramelized clusters accumulating, it deliberately mounts an inflammatory response that that contains infl in, inflammatory cytokines and oxygen-free radicals to deliberately create inflammation and oxidative stress. And so, um, and that's the, just the normal first uh, step in any healthy immune response is uh, kind of sounding the alarm and 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 letting and letting those um, and and uh, calling attention to the area so everything can be cleaned up. So it's a normal and healthy response to an abnormal, unhealthy situation. And if the brain is uh, is uh, under attack all the time by inflammation and oxidative stress, uh, it will malfunction. The other piece of the puzzle here that can cause, um, so these are the inflammatory cytokines and the oxygen free radicals that are being released to uh, to deal with that with with that sticky situation, if you will. <laughs> so, but it's not just sugar that can do this. It's not just sugar and refined starches that can do this. Um, vegetable oils um, also, um, for reasons we won't go into uh, in detail today, but there's more information in the book about this. Vegetable oils are also powerful promoters of oxidative stress. And one of the most alarming pieces of information I came across when I was researching the book is that our the body the, the fat in our bodies is gradually being replaced by um by vegetable by linoleic acid which is the uh, comp uh the harmful component of vegetable oil. So um that our fat is gradually our body's really supposed to store saturated fat because it's compact, it's lightweight, smooth, um good source of energy. And what's happened is instead of being uh, of storing saturated fat, is we're slowly uh, building up our our polyunsaturated fat storage in our in our fat cells, and um, uh, and th and this could have some very dire consequences for the for the body. But but when it comes to the brain, the brain absorbs some of that uh, the the linoleic acid and vegetable oil, and it creates uh, the brain starts to burn that that fatty acid for energy. And the brain is not supposed to burn fatty acids for energy. It's supposed to burn glucose and ketones, small molecules, not these long um, uh, polyunsaturated fats um, that are in vegetable oils. That creates a lot of excessive oxidative stress in the brain. So, and, and when you eat this wrong way, when you eat too many refined carbohydrates and vegetable oils, you can also throw your neurotransmitter systems out of balance. And uh, so, uh, this is a balanced pathway showing how you can turn the amino acid tryptophan, which comes from dietary protein, um, into various types of neurotransmitters. And so these are the very same neurotransmitters, serotonin, melatonin, GABA, glutamate, dopamine. These are the neurotransmitters. These are the brain chemicals that are becoming unbalanced in mental health conditions. And so, uh, and the way we eat can also unbalance these neurotransmitter systems, and these are these are the these are the um, neurotransmitter systems that we are we are that I'm at least was taught to prescribe medications to try to rebalance. But what if we stopped eating the things that unbalance them in the first place? Because if you've got too much inflammation and oxidative stress in the brain, which you will if you're eating refined carbohydrates and vegetable oils, you're going to be able to make less serotonin, less melatonin. And you're going to shift this whole pathway down what's called the neuroinflammatory pathway. And you're going to get more, less serotonin, less melatonin, more dopamine, less GABA. GABA is the brain's calming neurotransmitter. And now you're going to get a huge surge in glutamate. Glutamate is the brain's primary excitatory neurotransmitter. Now you've shifted your brain into overdrive and everything um, is uh, over overactive. That's called glutamate excitotoxicity. Too much glutamate in the brain. Glutamate is the uh, does, is there to excite the brain. We all need the brain to be awake to a certain extent and focused, but you can have too much of a good thing. If there's too much glutamate in the brain, and we see this across a wide spectrum of, of mental health disorders, that excess glutamate will physically damage proteins, lipids or fats in the brain, nucleic acids like, like DNA and RNA, um, and therefore, all of the critical structures in the brain can be injured, including the mitochondria, which do many things, but the thing they're most famous for is creating energy for the brain. It will weaken the blood-brain barrier, which is the brain's protective layer, which is supposed to reduce its risk um, uh, of exposure 
to risky substances that might be in the general circulation. And it can damage and kill cells in the hippocampus, the brain's learning and memory center. Um, and so we see in depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and in cognitive impairment uh, and early Alzheimer's disease, we see the hippocampus has shrunk to a smaller size. By the time you notice any memory problems and you, you've been diagnosed with what's called mild cognitive impairment or pre-Alzheimer's disease, the hippocampus can already have shrunk by 10%. So uh, this, is a, this is a silently mounting um, a damage process that's going on in the brain. So we've talked about how to nourish and protect the brain. How do you energize the brain? You energize the brain um, by making sure it's getting the molecules it needs to burn for fuel. So yes, the brain does need some glucose at all times. But as we just discussed, you, you don't want too much glucose in the brain. But even if you have significant insulin resistance or metabolic damage, you won't have to worry about low brain glucose. Glucose will always be able to cross the blood brain barrier and enter the brain. Um, no questions asked. What you need to worry about is low brain insulin. Because if you're eating in a way that demands a lot of insulin, the, the, the food that, that raises insulin levels the most is carbohydrate and the refined carbohydrates are the worst in terms of how much insulin it takes to process them. If you're eating in a way that contains too much of the wrong carbohydrate too often, or too much carbohydrate for your personal metabolism, uh, then uh, you'll still be able to get glucose into the brain. But the fact that you've, that you've been bombarding your system with insulin, high levels of insulin, multiple times a day for many years, that's gonna cause damage to the insulin signaling and insulin transport system. And it's gonna make it harder and harder for insulin to cross into the brain. The brain will become insulin resistant. And what this means is that less and less insulin will be able to cross in. That's a serious problem because the brain cannot use glucose to full capacity, can't turn it into energy, can't use it to build other things to full capacity efficiently and properly without adequate insulin. So over time, what you see with insulin resistance is um, you can have high blood sugar after meals, You can, which means you'll also have high brain sugar after meals, higher, the higher the blood sugar, the higher the brain sugar, they, 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 they mirror each other. But over time, what will happen is the higher the blood insulin, the lower the brain insulin. So now you've got a situation where your brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose and still be slowly starving to death. And that is um, that dire predicament is called cerebral glucose hypometabolism. Otherwise, it is a, a, simp a simpler put, more simply put, sluggish brain glucose processing. The brain is slowly losing its ability to turn glucose into energy. And by the time you notice any memory problems, you can already lost up to 25% of your brain's glucose processing capacity. And so we now know that many different types of mental health conditions, uh, you can see insulin resistance and or cerebral, what's called cerebral glucose hypometabolism or sluggish brain glucose processing. So this is a very uh, serious condition that has widespread effects uh, across a wide variety of mental health conditions. So obviously, you don't wanna wait until that happens to begin uh, trying to turn that around. You wanna really get those glucose levels under control uh, and you want to get your insulin levels into a nice, low, healthy range. That's the way you can protect yourself long-term against all kinds of mental health conditions. But no matter how old you are right now or how much metabolic damage you may think you have, it's never too late to turn this around and it doesn't take long. You can lower and normalize your glucose levels and your insulin levels within a matter of days to weeks. It may take months or even years to lose excess body fat that some of you may be hoping to lose. That's a, a healthy side effect of a healthy diet. What we really want to do as soon as we can is get those glucose and insulin levels down into a healthy range. Um, and then in many cases, um, most other things in most cases, most other things will correct will will take care of themselves if you do that. So, how do you nourish the brain? Include some animal foods. Avoid grains and legumes. There are a few other recommendations in the book as well. 
To protect the brain, avoid, like the plague, refined carbohydrates, vegetable oils, ultra-processed foods. And energize the brain. Get those glucose and insulin levels into a healthy range, avoid refined carbohydrates, and customize your carbohydrate intake to your metabolic tolerance. And I show you how to do this in the book, but the short answer is you want to make sure that your glucose levels don't go too high after meals, and you want to make sure that your insulin levels um, stay in a healthy range. So for some people that all that's going to take is all that you're going to need to do is just eat healthy whole foods and get the junk out. For others of us, many of us, unfortunately, including myself, we need to lower our overall carbohydrate intake, even from whole foods like fruits and vegetables. And for many of us that we may even need to go to a ketogenic level, meaning ultra low carbohydrate. So I argue in the book that, that the Mediterranean diet is, is, not, is not the best diet for the brain. Um, because it's based on nutrient-poor grains and legumes that are high in anti-nutrients. It encourages refined grains and alcohol, both of which um, uh, cause inflammation and oxidative stress, which are root causes of mental health conditions and physical health conditions. And it's too high in carbohydrate for the growing majority of us who now have insulin resistance. It's now, depending on how you define it, between 52% and 88% of us uh, in the United States anyway, now have insulin resistance and can no longer safely tolerate a significant amount of carbohydrate in the diet. So uh, that's why I argue in the book that we should draw the line at paleo, that we shouldn't be eating anything that isn't on a paleo diet. Um, paleo diet is just whole plant and animal foods minus the grains and legumes. So it includes animal foods, it excludes grains and legumes, it excludes all the modern processed foods. Um, but problem with a paleo diet, for some of us anyway, is that it doesn't put a limit on carbohydrate. So you can have as much fruit and starchy vegetable as you want. And that may be fine for some people, but for those of us with insulin resistance, it usually is not going to bring our glucose and insulin levels down low enough into a healthy enough range so we can still have some ongoing damage. And so this is the beauty of the ketogenic diet, is that if you're eating a carbohydrate-based diet and you have insulin resistance, then uh, your brain metabolism is going to be sluggish. Your glucose levels in the brain are gonna be spiking too often. Um, you're gonna be getting ongoing damage and reduction in brain energy over time. If you switch to a ketogenic diet, fat-based diet, um, that is going to, uh, when you're burning fat vigorously enough, you bring your insulin levels down low enough, fat burning turns on. Fat burning cannot turn on if your insulin levels are too high. High insulin levels turn fat burning off. The brain cannot even see that you've got energy there to burn. So get your insulin levels down low enough to start burning fat. And if you're burning fat vigorously enough, some of that fat will be turned into ketones. Ketones will cross the blood brain barrier and bridge that energy gap and fuel those cells which have been sputtering along, trying to do their best on glucose, but, but really having a difficult time. So um, we know that metabolic dysfunction is strongly connected to poor mental health. So we see these conditions go hand in hand far more often than you would think if it were just a coincidence. So roughly three times as likely if you have a metabolic health condition to have a mental condi health condition and vice versa. So um, that's a very strong level of association. And there's emerging evidence now um, that ketogenic diets can be useful in treating uh, a wide variety of uh, mental health conditions. And this makes sense because a ketogenic diet energizes the brain um, uh, in a much more efficient, a safe and efficient way. Ketogenic diets reduce inflammation, they reduce oxidative stress, they normalize glucose levels, they produce ketones, which can bridge that energy gap. You get multiple, multiple benefits from a ketogenic diet across the brain. So it improves the whole health of the brain. And the side effect is that it improves the health of the body as well. We do not need a different diet for every organ system we possess. That would make absolutely no sense. So what's good for one organ system is good for another. What's good for the brain is good for the heart, is good for the kidneys, is good for, is, is good for uh, the muscles, it's good for uh, the liver, it's good for every aspect of health. So we have um, 
a lot of evidence emerging, not just case reports and case series in a variety of conditions, but also some clinical trials in autism, in bipolar disorder, in major depression, um, in alcohol withdrawal, in, uh, and in Alzheimer's disease. And um, I was just going to spend just a moment to give you an example. If this is a study I helped publish in 2022, um, the work of my good friend and colleague, Dr. Albert Denat, who is a psychiatrist practicing in Toulouse, France for more than 35 years. He put, uh, he invited 31 of his most treatment resistant patients uh, to come into the hospital and try a ketogenic diet, a whole foods, mildly ketogenic diet uh, under his supervision to see whether or not it would help them. These, uh, um, and what, uh, so he invited 31 to come into the hospital, which they eagerly did because these were people who had been suffering for many years with treat what's called treatment resistant, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and severe major depression. Um, and uh, so they voluntarily came into the hospital to see if this would work. 28 of them were able to stay on the diet uh, for more than two weeks, which is what you need to do to start to see benefits. Um, and these were, you know, uh, all adults. Uh, many of them were unable to work due to psychiatric disability. They were taking an average of five psychiatric medications at the time they came into the hospital. All but one of them had at least one marker. I mean, all of them had at least one marker of poor metabolic health, meaning high blood sugar or obesity or high blood pressure or high triglycerides, which are fats in the blood. Um, so these these were all people who had both mental health condition as well as metabolic dysfunction. And it's very common, as we said, for them to go hand in hand. The dietary intervention was a very, very uh, simple, uh, mildly ketogenic diet, uh, 15 to 20% protein, not, not excessive protein, very low carbohydrate, and most of the calories were from fat. These were, this was a whole foods diet. And what he observed was remarkable. Um, depression and psychosis symptoms in people with these mood and psychotic disorders dropped dramatically. Every person that stayed on the diet uh, for more than two weeks, which was 28 of them, improved substantially. Um, and, uh, and, and so not just a little bit. <laughs> so just to, to, to put this in, into pictures, um, what you see in terms of people with major depression in studies of antidepressants, uh, you see uh, the magnitude of the effect is about 0.3. There's a measure that's used in research studies called an, a, a Cohen's D effect size, doesn't matter. Basically what you see in, with antidepressants is this effect size or the magnitude of the response is about 0.3. And that's considered a, a good but small effect size. Um, when Dr. Dana put his patients on this ketogenic diet, uh, the magnitude of their response, the improvement in their depression symptoms was more than 10 times better than with antidepressants. And with antipsychotics uh, medications, you usually see the response rate is about 0.5 in terms of its magnitude. With uh, this uh, ketogenic diet, about seven times better than uh, standard antipsychotic medication treatment. So these were not subtle improvements. And 100% of people improved. 44% of patients in this study achieved clinical remission from their primary psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, these were people who had been ill for an average of 10 years, some as long as 30 years. And most of them had been in treatment with this very same psychiatrist uh, for that entire length of time. Their metabolic health improved remarkably. Blood sugars came down, hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure, weight. Uh, even though most of these people were taking antipsychotic medications, uh, which are notorious for causing tremendous amounts of weight gain that is almost impossible to lose. Um, uh, despite the fact that they were taking these powerful uh, medications, um, they lost a significant, a clinically significant amount of weight. Liver function tests improved, triglycerides dropped like a stone, ketogenic diets and almost always uh, caused dramatic drops in, in uh, triglycerides or circulating fats in the blood. And 64% uh, of these patients left the hospital on less psychiatric medication than when they came in. 
Now, this wasn't a randomized controlled trial. He didn't divide people into two groups and say, you're going to do a ketogenic diet, you're going to do a Mediterranean diet or some other kind of diet. Uh, so th th uh, we do need ran randomized controlled trials to be able to, uh, um, to understand better um, how, to what extent the ketogenic diet was responsible for, the, for, these, um, for these improvements. But we think the diet had a lot to do with it because these patients had been hospitalized multiple times before, either in this same hospital or the sister hospital nearby by the same psychiatrist and had never seen this degree of improvement before. The only difference this time was the ketogenic diet. So uh, we can say it was feasible, it was safe, it was well tolerated, it's a low risk high potential benefit uh, intervention. There are lots more studies ar around the world underway. And actually, ever since the, even since this slide was, was created, um, uh, we've had two new studies published already. One Stanford University, Ketogenic Diets for Bipolar Disorder and Schizophrenia, just published last week. And Dr. Ian Campbell in, at, in Scotland uh, has published a pilot trial of ketogenic diets in bipolar disorder, showing that um, people with bipolar disorder um, felt a lot better the higher their ketones were, and that their brain levels of glutamate, that excitatory, um, uh, potentially toxic uh, levels of high levels of uh, glutamate that we were talking about before, that their brain glutamate levels came down more with a ketogenic diet than, when, than with any other intervention that's ever been studied. So if you're interested in learning more about metabolic psychiatry and all the all the amazing potential it has to help with mental health conditions, I encourage you to explore the Metabolic Mind website. It's a, just a treasure trove of information and inspiration. Um, and I would also say, you know, anybody with a mental health condition, including you yourself, if you're one of them, you deserve a metabolic evaluation if you haven't had one yet. Um, these are on your slides. I believe you'll have access to these after the presentation. This is what you should be aiming for in terms of ideal values. If your values are higher than this, then you've got a little work to do, but it's not difficult. If you lower your glucose and insulin levels, these will come down. Like I said, these can come down in a matter of days to weeks. If you're thinking about starting a ketogenic diet for any, any condition, mental health or otherwise, there are some things you need to learn about it before you try to start one. And ideally you wanna do this with some professional support because there are uh, some conditions that can make starting the diet dangerous. And especially if you're taking certain medications or have certain health conditions. Um, so I teach a whole um, clinician training on this topic. If you're a clinician, um, uh, I have a training program you can take either live or offline. And um, that helps you understand how to use these diets safely in people with mental health conditions. And I also have a clinician directory. If you're looking for somebody to help you transition safely onto a ketogenic diet, it's a free directory to search on my website. It's international and you can search by, um, by service type or you can search by location. And um, if you want to learn more about, uh, about um, uh, nutrition in general and ketogenic diets in particular, um, uh, uh, I, my book includes lots of information for uh, that uh, I've written in a way that I, I hope will most um, kind of everyday people will be able to to learn a lot about the science and understand it and apply it. So it's about ketogenic diets, but it's also about paleo diets and carnivore diets and um, and gives tips uh, for people who are eating plant-based diets as well, uh, how to optimize brain health. So really the reason I wrote this book is because most people with mental health conditions don't realize that dietary interventions can be very powerful uh, brain health strategies. Um, they can help you in ways no medicine can, but you have to know which dietary changes are most worth making and why, and they're not the ones that we're used to hearing about. If you understand how brain food works, you can put together your own diet. I give you all the information you need to do this to personalize it for yourself. Um, according to your food sensitivities, your metabolic health, um, your personal goals, um, and your and your dietary preferences. Um, uh, if you haven't tried these approaches yet, you really owe it to yourself to explore them. So uh, I like to say your hope is on the menu. So thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. And I'm looking forward to uh, questions during the panel discussion a little later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Eid. I really um, 
I'm, I'm a little choked up as a facilitator. I try and keep myself together to like facilitate all this, but I'm reading the chats and listening to you. Um, I don't think there's anyone here that isn't just mind blown and heart wide open. Um, so as much as I'm trying to keep it all together, I am welling up because I believe what you've just done is give us hope for something that for so long, um, many of us haven't had through this lens. So for, um, I'm sure my tears are welcome, but I, for all of us, I just want to say I'm really, really grateful. Um, you'll see it in the chat and we're thrilled you're going to be here for the panel. So if I might invite all of us for a 10 minute reset, just a 10 minute reset in your workbook as I dry my tears. You guys all have a reflection page. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting <laughs> you all have a reflection <laughs> page. I invite you to jot your thoughts down. Um, not only will Dr. Ed be here, but all of our speakers will be here for this. So you, any question that you have, you want to make sure to put in the Q&A. And we'll take a 10-minute moment to just digest everything, get clear on how our questions can be most useful to the community, and then give all of our speakers a moment to um take care of their own biological needs otherwise, right? And then we'll be back for a wonderful uh, moment in time with all of us. So we'll put some music on, put a timer on, more to follow. We are not done, but we wanna give everybody a moment to stretch, digest, and uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>